Thank you. Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Diana Hens, and she's an assistant uh, professor at the University of Illinois, and she got uh, her PhD from the University of Washington with um, both us. And she has been the uh, last uh, um, postdoc for a pair of before joining the uh, University of Illinois. She works on many areas in the, in the of the house school of clouds and dissipation, microfilms, and severe weather. And she's been, been besides the sciences, she like Warren's legacy in the areas of science communication and diversity and uh, um, okay. Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> These things are never fr friendly to female clothing. <laughs> so, thank you, Fuji. Um, so I'm. I think this is going to be a bit of a hard shift in gears. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is this idea of having science by and for all. Now, this picture here is an example of how I interact with more, and I am neither a climate scientist nor a modeler. Um, so I work in weather observations mostly. Um, but I first met Warren as part of the NCARSOARS program, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And this is an example of one of Warren's biggest legacies is his contributions to mentorship of young scientists. So as an early career scientist now and faculty member, this idea of how do we support people throughout their careers so that we can increase the diversity of our field is very important to me. So when we see pictures like this, this is actually from the University of Illinois' um, Office of Inclusion website. This raises a really important question as to what do we think about when we think about diversity. And I wanted to put a picture of the United Colors of Benetton, because that's often what think, people think about, but then I was going to think about copyright. Um, so I went with this instead. But we try to think about, OK, you know, people of different races, different genders, different backgrounds, um, <coughs> different varieties. But there's another really important part of this. We also have to think about what is inclusion. So how do we make the field a place where people want to work, where they will thrive? So the argument that I'm going to make here is that inclusion and diversity is a necessity for the future of our field, not just a nicety. So this, pic this poster here is from SACNIS, the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans. Uh, I think I forgot a letter in sciences. Um, <laughs> from the March, on science, uh, the March for Science that happened a few years ago. And I really like this idea of like, great minds think differently. So when we think about when people coming from a variety of different backgrounds, the way that they're going to think about problems, the way they're going to approach problems, what problems they're even going to choose is going to vary. And that is a good and necessary thing. So there's three components of this that we have to think about when we think about diversity and inclusion. First, who is allowed to even pursue the work? So what gateways do people have to clear to be able to become scientists? What kind of work is valued? So what kind of problems are people going to say, oh, that's good science, we should give that person an award, for example. Give them a promotion. And finally, in tying into that, for whom do we do this work? And when you think about it, it's just like, we're all, you know, we're Americans, we pay taxes, therefore our scientific enterprise should benefit all of the taxpayers, right? So for that last point in particular, this is where we're thinking about science for all. And I would make this argument that when we think about this, we need the greatest diversity in our scientific field so to make sure that we are serving the communities of all within the United States and around the world. So this picture here was actually from the Champaign-Urbana March for Science. And this was a really great gathering to see people. This is actually at the, um, the Children's Science Museum in Champaign-Urbana. There were people sitting on the floor. And it was really wonderful in that they did an excellent job 
of bringing up a diversity of scientists. We, we, there was a scientist that was um, an immigrant from Iran. We, we had a scientist who um, was working on, I think this was the greatest one where I found out that there was someone working on the impacts of severe weather on lizard populations in the southeast United States. I'm like, that is so cool. <laughs> you know, it was just a really great showcase of the diversity of science that was happening at the university, but then also the diversity of the scientists who were working on these various different things. But the reality is, and I mean, as already has been alluded to by previous speakers, when we think about the atmospheric sciences, we're not doing that great. This is actually from the National Science Foundation report in 2012. So these numbers are a little old, but they still tell the story. This line here is a line for the physical sciences. So not only are we kind of battling for last place in terms of number of um, science and engineering bachelor's degrees earned by underrepresented minorities during this time period, um, but the numbers have really flatlined in recent years. Um, so then if we break that down into some of these different fields, this bo box right here is Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. So, and this is the number of degrees at the bachelor's, master's, and PhD <laughs> level. So we have not only an issue that we have some of the fewest in all of the sciences, but on top of that, we leave out numbers as we go along. Which gets to this issue of science by all. So how are we thinking about who becomes scientists in our field? And this diagram is the breakdown of um, the racial breakdown of science, uh, science and engineers working in science and engineering occupations. And so the traditionally underrepresented minorities are this small section of the pie here. Um, so thinking about then, who are we having working as scientists in our field? Now, one of the ways that this was thought about for a long time was this idea of a leaky pipeline. This was especially thought about um, in terms of women serving in our field. And so this idea that, okay, we have some kids that start learning about science in K through 12. We have people who lose interest at that. Then you get to the next level, um, people, we lose people in the transition. And then at the undergrad level, we lose more people, and so on and so forth, until the numbers that we get to when we get to the career stage, or even at the grad stage, are very, very small. But I want to change that a little bit, and I think that the ideas around this have shifted in recent years, to think about more pathways. So what are some of the different ways that when people are coming in, say, for example, into undergraduate, what different career pathways do they follow? Now, you notice that all these arrows are unidirectional, and I just didn't add more because it would have been a super messy graph. But this idea that you know, we often think about this pathway as being very linear, from undergrad, master's, PhD, and then career of some kind. But the reality is a lot more complicated, and I think, again, that is a good thing. That leads to a diversity of experience that people can have. So how do we support people through the many, many different ways that their career paths can follow? So this is when I'm thinking about broadening these pathways into the atmospheric science workforce. And I really like this quote from Lyndon Johnson that talks about the fifth freedom. And the fifth freedom is the ability to develop your talents to your full potential regardless of uh, and unhampered by arbitrary barriers of race, birth, income, and I'd also add gender. And there's other categories I could add to that as well. So how do we best support people through the development of their talents? Oops. So, yeah, I saw you already got a little quote, a uh, little uh, giveaway of my little joke there. But one question I really want you to deeply think about is who and what type of person do you see as an ideal scientist? That is a really deep and profound question. Because, and, as, and that's where I'm going to say that you might be able to think, well, oh gosh, she's trying to trap me, right? But this is something that people really, really need to think about. Because I think 
there is a very, very necessary discussion that has to go into when we're thinking about helping people along these pathways and their, through their career, what are we even looking for? And that leads to a very, very, very necessary discussion as to implicit bias. So there are very explicit biases. There's a very explicit discrimination that happens all up and down the chain, and we can talk at length about that. But there's also these things that happen at internal levels by well-intentioned people that they don't realize what, we, what they're doing. This is the, some of the things that the microaggressions that, Mike, that Marshall mentioned earlier. It's not that people mean to do bad things. It's not that they mean to discriminate or they mean to um, be mean, right? It's just that there are these inherent biases that we have, have buried within us, all of us do, that lead to behaviors that can really disadvantage certain populations. And those biases are built into the very structures that also make a lot of the decisions about how people advance, et cetera, through our, through our career. So this particular quote was actually from a paper after the Supreme Court decision that basically said that you have to be able to prove discrimination, you have to be able to, you basically have to prove that there's intention to discriminate. And it, what, this, what this paper was making an argument for was that by insisting that there must be some kind of you know, smoking gun blame worthy perpetrator, that you're, it, that you're basically creating this world, this imaginary world, where discrimination doesn't exist unless it's consciously intended. And that's, that is not the case, and that is not the reality that we face. So, Here's an example of what I mean by this, and, and how, implicit, how relatively insidious implicit bias and some of these other things can be. So when we think about someone's progression through school, for example, but I would also say you can make the argument that this applies to progression to career as well. You think, okay, here's the basics. You go to class, all right? Study hard, you know, do your work. Get, if you study hard, you'll get good grades, okay? Then, if you get good grades, you'll graduate. And then, from that, magically profit. <laughs> right? So we think that this is a very straightforward progression. But the reality is, for a lot of people, this is much, much more complicated. And this is where the implicit bias is, because there's, impl there's a lot of inherent bias in assuming that everyone has the same access to the same opportunities, the same resources, Etc. So just for as an example, can I even afford class? Do I actually have the money? Do I have a good environment to study in? Do I have a safe place that I can go? Will I be given credit for my work, or will that be somehow you know given to somebody else? Um, have I had the appropriate advising? Will even other students actually study with me? So. There's new, numerous things that can happen along the way that can derail someone for no fault of their own. And some of those things are where, again, these structural biases are built into, um, into how we evaluate students that don't take a lot of this stuff into account. So th there's a study um, of best practices back in 2004 that put together a bunch of um, criteria that was being necessary to especially support underrepresented students. And one thing, the things you'll notice is very number one, institutional leadership. The institution needing to be on board is, and taking this as valuable and important. Targeted recruitment, not just saying, oh, no, we'll take as many as come to us, actually going to the places where these students are and being very active in saying, hey, we welcome you, come to us. Engaged faculty, faculty who are invested in this process. Personal attention, so advising, mentorship. Peer support, so having a cohort of people who are going through the same things that you are, that, you know, it's like, you think about your cohort in graduate school. I know mine was pretty great, and we worked together on homeworks and everything, and that, that was a very supportive structure. Um, in, in rich and very real research experiences. So not just doing grunt work, but actually doing something that's meaningful. 
having support to bridge to the next step, not just assuming people know where to go. And then finally, continuous evaluation, so continuous updates as to how people are doing. And then one, and number one, and biggest one, comprehensive financial support. So put money where the mouth is, right? So this is, this is baby scientist Deanna um, when I was in the source program. And my mentor was, when shall we? And so when we think about these programs designed to help bridge support for underrepresented students, SOARS has been shown to be one of the most successful at doing this, and especially getting students into graduate school. Now, there has been a lot of focus on the undergraduate research experience, and of course, I'm at an institution that serves undergraduates, so of course I think about the students who are in front of me and, that, and helping that. Um, so, the SOARS strategy is a, basically a five-pronged model of mentoring the whole student, relating research to society, so again, having these, these very deeply relevant, real research experiences, having that peer network, that cohort, having the opportunity to be a role model, let alone having a role model, and then finally developing healthy coping mechanisms. So at the University of Illinois, one thing that I have been very active in is trying to figure out how to expand the SOARS model into the university environment. Right now, you know, SOARS is in a, is in a uh, national laboratory. How do we expand this model of support into the university environment? So these are some of the things that we're experimenting with. I'm on the NSF grant to support SOARS to do this. Um, so expanding that mentorship model to year-round support. Providing meaningful research opportunities for students at their home institutions so if they cannot go to Boulder for some reason, then they won't have to. And then engaging um, the students in year-round professional development. Now one thing that's really important, a lot of the diversity that for predominantly white institutions like the University of Illinois is that a lot of our diversity comes in both you know, socioeconomic, racial, et cetera, comes from two-year colleges. And um, so how do we build partnerships with these institutions to help, again, make this transition into the four-year college university, especially for a predominantly white institution, easier and smoother? Um, so this is a picture of Parkland College students that came when we brought the Doppler on wheels to campus a few years ago. So the last thing I really want to touch on, um, and this is one thing that's really important. As was mentioned in previous talks, a lot of the work of diversity has the tendency to fall on underrepresented uh, minority faculty. So basically, it falls upon the, the, the people who are often the, you know, uh, oh, how do I say? Um, well, most of the work has a tendency to fall on underrepresented faculty members. To be able to change that, to make this an institutional priority, one of the big things that has to change is that this is being valued, that this is being seen as valued by the institution. Meaning that the valuation models, say for example, early career faculty members like myself, that if they're going to take on this kind of work, it has to be seen as something that's, that is valuable in addition to their science and the other that obligations that they have. So to make this an institutional priority, it has to become an institutional priority, meaning it has to be valued at that level. So basic take-home message is that diversity makes for better science and scientists, that more people need to be brought into the science conversation, and making that as multiple-way conversation as possible is valuable. And then finally, the individual and institutional effort is necessary to making lasting change. So that's it for me. Thanks.